have an update on Barrick Malley. Finally. We kind of have an update. We'll get into that. Because actually there is no update, I would argue, but we're going to talk about that shortly. But the Globe and Mail is now reporting on it, so we're going to parse that out a little bit so that we know what's going on there. Hello and welcome to the Northern Miner Podcast. My name's Adrian Pocabelli. On a mission to help us figure out what's going on here, over the weekend, quite an interesting result with gold. Of course, thriving off of uncertainty, as Jeffrey Christian has pointed out, probably the main factor in gold's attraction as an investment vehicle, uncertainty. We saw it spike over the weekend, and quite interestingly, that was in Pax Gold, the crypto that follows gold on Binance, a major gold back crypto, the gold back crypto. And I have owned it in the past, and it generally tracks the gold price. Interestingly, it shot up, according to Coindesk, up to $2,923 over the weekend before falling back down to par. Now we are at $2,394, not too far from the actual gold price. So quite fascinating to see that. Of course, crypto is a 24-7 market. And as you see, BlackRock is now talking about making all real world assets, you know, have a digital crypto we're starting to see why. It almost felt old-fashioned waiting for the traditional markets to open on Sunday night. Now, over to this Barrick Malley article, which we've been following for over five weeks, actually, is when I first reported on it. And there's kind of an interesting story. So the Globe and Mail reports that there are two sources for this story. I'd argue it's one, though, and maybe a bit of a misunderstanding of the second. So first we had the Africa report, which came out about five weeks ago. That was on, to give us an exact date, that came out on March 8th with the headline, In Mali, Wagner has big plans for gold mines, where we first discuss this possibility that perhaps Wagner wanted to move in on Barrick's massive Lulo Guncoto mine in Africa, which is considered one of the world's biggest producing 683,000 ounces of gold in 2023 for Barrick, about an eighth of its production. So a massive mine in Mali that basically Wagner wanted to do a soft takeover. So that came out in, again, March 8th. Then we got this report last week on April 9th, so a month later from ADF, which is Africa Defense Forum, Russia tightens controls of Malian gold, and it starts out by actually quoting four paragraphs down a Malian source from the Africa report. So actually, they're just, in fact, reporting what the article, the Africa report, and quoting it. As it says here, quote, Wagner's men controlled access to the mine for a time, referring to an artisanal mine, the Intahaka mine in the Gao region on February 9th. That was an artisanal gold mine that Wagner forced local artisanal miners out of. And referring to that, quote, Wagner's men control access to the mine for a time. They charge an entrance fee to people coming to extract the gold, end quote. And this is, again, referring to the Africa report. So ADF is simply restating and quoting from the Africa report, a report on a report, we might say. So then several paragraphs down, the ADF says, Experts say Mali's most productive gold mines, Lulo and Guncoto, run by Canada's Barrick Gold, are in Russia's crosshairs. In 2022, the two mines produced 19.4 tons of gold, nearly a third of the country's 66-ton production. And here's a quote from the Africa report. Quote, The authorities want to expropriate Barrick Gold, but without doing so too openly, and quote, a Malian source close to the discussions told the Africa Report magazine. So we read this quote five weeks ago, and then the ADF quotes the Africa Report again. Quote, after the sector audit report was submitted last August, the finance minister wrote to all the mining companies operating in Mali to renegotiate their operating contracts. But this is just window dressing. Their real target is Barrick. End quote. So really all that's happening here is the ADF is reporting on the article from the Africa Report. Then we get the Globe and Mail yesterday from Jeffrey York, Africa bureau chief, Barrick facing uncertainty in Mali amid reports of regime seeking control of mine. And looking at this article from the Globe and Mail, so you might say the biggest publication, the first you know daily newspaper to report on this, 
Barrick Gold is facing mounting pressure in Mali as the country's military regime seeks to boost its control of the multi-billion dollar mining sector at a time of growing Russian influence over its economy. Now there are reports, plural, that the regime could be seeking to expropriate a key barrack mining complex, Lulo Guncoto, one of the world's biggest gold-producing mines. Toronto-based Barrick is declining to comment, and as a matter of fact, the Northern Miner reached out in March, as well as April, emailed Barrick, and we also never got a comment. Which doesn't look good. It seems to give the argument more credence. Let's continue. Scrolling down a bit, two publications, the Africa Report News Magazine and the U.S. military publication Africa Defense Forum, have suggested that Mali's military junta is targeting the Lulo Guncoto complex, which Barrick says has contributed more than $1 billion to Mali's economy over the past year. Now, it gets parsed out a little bit later in the article. So this is the Globe and Mail now talking about these reports. Africa Defense Forum published by the Africa Command of the U.S. Military, reported last week that Barrick's gold mining complex in Mali is, quote, in Russia's crosshairs, end quote. Citing the Africa Report article, it said the Mali authorities want to expropriate the Lulo Gunkoto mine and remove Barrick from the mine. Both reports suggest that Barrick was the main target of a government attempt to renegotiate contracts with foreign mining companies after the recent audit. Now, I have a different interpretation than the Globe and Mail on this. The reason that the Africa Defense Forum is saying that Barrick's gold mining complex in Mali is, quote, in Russia's crosshairs, end quote, is because of the article from the Africa Report. That is in the middle of the article in Russia's crosshairs after they have already, you know, quoted from the Africa Report in the ADF article, if you're following me. It's a little complex, but it's important because we actually, I would argue, only have that original report that we have from five weeks ago. Yes, there is a new publication, ADF, that is also saying that Barrick's Gold Complex is in, quote, Russia's crosshairs, according to the ADF. But to me, that is simply them interpreting the article from the Africa report. So it's not exactly two sources in my interpretation. Finally here, the Globe and Mail sought a response from Barrick spokesperson Kathy Duplessy, but she declined to comment. Liam Morrissey, a mining security analyst, said he is skeptical that Mali's military officials would seize the Barrick mine. Quote, They know that if there is a major change imposed on the mining sector, there will be an overnight collapse, end quote, he told the Globe. And it's an interesting point. I mean, if you're Barrick Gold, one imagines you're not about to leave the keys in the engine for all of this mining equipment. One imagine it's at least going to take a few months to get this mine back in operation, maybe with help from Russian expertise. They are, remember, helping build a processing facility with the Malians in Mali. So it's not crazy to think it would be taken over, but there would be a delay. And as the Africa report was saying, they want a bit of a soft takeover, if that is even possible. So. For all of the reports you're now starting to see on this, I would argue there is actually no new information here, other than the fact that Barrick continues to not issue a response. So that is the latest on this Wagner Barrick Gold story out of Mali. Quite an interesting story we've been following, again, for five weeks here. But perhaps we will start to get movement now that it is in a major daily, the Globe and Mail. And earnings season is about to begin with Alcoa tomorrow. Now, just a quick update on the Eastern DRC. We are seeing, according to SABC, South Africa Broadcasting Corporation, we are continuing to see civilians get killed. We have a report of 40 civilians being killed in the Eastern DRC in less than three weeks, which suggests that the intensity of the fighting doesn't seem to be declining. Is a general tenor here. It continues. And of course, as we've pointed out in previous episodes, Colton is the major resource that is in the Eastern DRC. When you think of DRC, you often think of the Copper Belt, which goes through Zambia. That is not where this fighting is taking place. This is in the Eastern DRC by Rwanda, kind of in the central to the east side of the country. And I checked with ChatGPT again, what Colton is used for, and it is a critical component in the manufacture of capacitors and high-performance batteries, 
used in a wide range of products, including smartphones, laptops, and digital cameras. So it's used in electronics. And tantalum is derived from coltan, is used extensively in the electronics industry. It is crucial for manufacturing capacitors and high-performance batteries. I also asked how much of the world's coltan comes from the Congo. And it's thought that the DRC holds around 60 to 80% of the world's coltan reserves. 60 to 80% of this crucial material is in this region. You know, I asked just for fun, ChatGPT, is the reason for this conflict natural resources? And the answer was yes. The conflict in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo is deeply intertwined with the region's abundant natural resources. The presence of valuable minerals such as coltan, gold, and diamonds has been a significant factor in fueling ongoing conflicts. Now, continuing on, speaking of diamonds, Botswana is unhappy because the G7 countries are asking Botswana, a major diamond producer, to send all of them to Belgium to verify where they came from. And apparently they have their own verification systems, which they feel are not being respected by the G7. Botswana President Mokwitsi Masisi told diplomats in Gaborone Wednesday the G7 traceability mechanism poses an unfair burden on African diamond producers. Quote, we cannot agree to an attempt to undermine our quest for development by taking charge and responsibility of our own value addition of our resources. Because if you make Belgium Antwerp the single node for verification, gosh, what impudence. When we mine our diamonds here and we are certain they are mined here and you add another layer of cost, delay, and time, and risk to direct interaction with customers and clients, and you take them still to Antwerp, it's not acceptable. End quote. So... Botswana not happy with the G7 wanting their diamonds to be verified in Belgium. Now, turning over to this other huge story that happened over the weekend, which is the banning of Russian metal at the LME and the CME. So here we have an article from Bloomberg via mining.com. Metals whipsawed as sanctions on new Russian supplies rattle LME. Metals swung sharply, with aluminum surging by a record before later erasing most of its gains as traders digest U.S. and U.K. sanctions that ban delivery of new Russian supplies onto the London Metal Exchange. The curbs on aluminum, nickel, and copper announced late Friday don't prevent Russia from selling its metals to buyers outside the U.S. or U.K. and don't restrict the vast majority of global trade in metals, which takes place directly between miners, traders, and manufacturers rather than through the exchange. But the sanctions will still reverberate through metals markets because of the LME's central position at the heart of the industry. Its prices are used as a benchmark and referenced in a huge number of contracts around the world, and many buyers view the ability to deliver on the LME as essential. And here's a quote from Amy Gower, metal strategist at Morgan Stanley, who said in an email, quote, While the new restrictions do not stop the trade of Russian metal, we could see some temporary upside support for prices of copper, aluminum, and nickel. And then further down the article, aluminum jumped as much as 9% as the market opened, the most since the current form of the contract was launched in 1987, while nickel rose as much as 8.8%. However, both metals were up around 2% as trading got underway in Europe, and copper was a little changed. And finally, Russia is an important metal producer accounting for 6% of global nickel supply, 5% of aluminum, and 4% of copper. So the State Department in the U.S., state.gov, put out a press release as well on April 12th, taking actions to reduce Russia's revenue from metals trade. And this is Matthew Miller, department spokesman. And it says the United States, in coordination with the United Kingdom, is today taking additional actions to disrupt Russian revenue from its metals trading by prohibiting the importation into the United States of aluminum, copper, and nickel of Russian origin. The U.S. Department of the Treasury has also issued a new determination that prohibits the exportation, re-exportation, sale, or supply of warranting services to any person located in the Russian Federation for aluminum, copper, or nickel of Russian origin on a global metal exchange and services to those metals of Russian Federation origin as part of the physical settlement of a derivative contract. These prohibitions have been narrowly tailored to limit market disruption by exempting Russian aluminum, nickel, and copper that was produced prior to April 13th, 2024. So in other words, all of the metal from Russia before April 13th is fine. But anything new is under sanction right now. Final paragraph here. As a result of today's actions, the London Metal Exchange and Chicago Mercantile Exchange will no longer accept new aluminum, copper, and nickel produced by Russia. 
Metal exchanges provide a central role in facilitating the trading of industrial metals around the globe. By taking joint action, the United States and UK are depriving Russia of revenue needed to fund its illegal war against Ukraine. Now, this is all happening as we have a metals breakout. And one wonders about the timing on this. It seems like terrible timing, doesn't it? I mean, it's not like metals are breaking down. They are breaking out, interestingly. And then we have that automobile makers are panicking, as we saw last week. Check out that show if you want to hear from several automobile CEOs on what is happening to their industry. The disruption by Build Your Dreams, BYD, I mean, with shockingly low car prices, I mean, unbelievable, $9,700. It sounds like a false report, but Electrek, they were just quoted by CNBC today. I was reading an article on Tesla, you know, laying off 10% of its force, I would argue, as a direct result of BYD's pricing right now. They have to cut costs, like if they want to continue to make cars. It's kind of that simple. You know, their low-cost vehicle was going to be around $25,000. If BYD is putting out a $9,700 car, I mean, how do you compete with that? Again, according to a report by Electric, who has just been quoted by CNBC, because, of course, Electric had the memo that Elon Musk sent to employees. So pretty impressive website there on Electric Vehicle News. And, of course, there is Ursula von der Leyen out today saying, it's time we're going to get tough on China, and we're going to put tariffs on Chinese imports, particularly of this clean energy stuff. In other words, solar panels, automobiles, and everything. So the way I see it, I was thinking about this. The West can put all the sanctions it wants on Chinese vehicles, but there's the whole world market. What about South America? What about Africa? Where are the growth markets anyways? You know, Southeast Asia, where's the growth? It's in places like Africa. Are they going to put sanctions on BYD, or are they going to welcome these cheap vehicles coming into their markets? You know, electric vehicles. So there is that. And there's also a headline which also came out on April 15th from Reuters, exclusive Russia and China trade new copper disguised as scrap to skirt taxes and sanctions. And here they are saying that RCC and Chinese firms have avoided taxes and skirted the impact of Western sanctions by trading a new copper wire rod disguised as scrap. Three sources familiar with the matter told Reuters. Copper wire rod was shredded in China's remote Xinjiang Uyghur region by an intermediary to make it difficult to distinguish from scrap, the sources said, allowing both exporters and importers to profit from differences in tariffs applied to scrap and new metal, the sources said. So interesting report to come out in the midst of all of these new sanctions. And then there was a... Article from Bloomberg, new metal sanctions push Russia further into China's embrace. U.S. and U.K. sanctions on Russian metals will cement China as Moscow's buyer of last resort for key commodities and enhance Shanghai's role as a venue to set prices for materials crucial to the global economy. The London Metal Exchange ban on newly produced Russian aluminum, copper, and nickel is likely to drive Chinese imports even higher. It also leaves the Shanghai Futures Exchange as the only major commodities burst in the world to accept Russian shipments of the three metals. The liquidity of Russian metals in European and American markets may further decline, and global trade flows will be reshaped, said Wang Rong, a senior analyst at Shanghai-based broker Guotai Hunan Futures Company. Scrolling down a bit, even without formal sanctions, China's imports of Russian aluminum have hit record levels. Russian aluminum giant United Russell International generated 23% of its revenue from China last year, compared with just 8% in 2022. The new sanctions will push more exports of Russian metal to countries outside of U.S. and U.K. jurisdictions, especially China, according to Guotai Hunan. The extra supply will also encourage the export of metals produced in China as more material pools within its borders, the broker said in a note. China is the world's biggest producer of refined copper and aluminum and a major player in nickel via investments in Indonesia, as we've discussed many times on this program. Chinese importers have taken advantage of Beijing's strategic alliance with Moscow to win discounts on key raw materials, paying in yuan to bypass the dollar, the currency in which trades are usually settled. That helped the world's biggest commodities buyers stave off the inflationary impact of the war in Ukraine as well as advancing Beijing's desire to unseat the greenback as the world's reserve currency. Finally, we have a headline here. Russell says new Western sanctions won't hurt its aluminum supply. This is Reuters via mining.com. 
Russian aluminum giant Russell said on Monday that new sanctions on Russian metals introduced by the United States and Britain will have no impact on its ability to supply aluminum to world markets. The Kremlin said on Monday that it considered the sanctions illegal and a double-edged sword that would hurt the interests of those imposing them. And then we hear from Goldman Sachs, who said it did not expect any immediate supply shock. Quote, from a fundamental perspective, it is important to recognize that these exchange-focused rule adjustments will not generate a necessary supply-demand shock. End quote. Russian producers can continue to sell metal to other non-U.S. or U.K. markets, Goldman Sachs said. But the question remains is, at what price? It seems to me the whole strategy of Russia and China, from an economic point of view, is let's supply cheap commodities to ourselves and to the global south at a lower price and that the West will be paying a higher price and that this will be a structural advantage. To me, that seems to be the strategy. And they say, hey, you want to sanction our metals? Go ahead. We'll sell it to China and maybe even at a discount. Just to cap this whole topic off, we have Rio Tinto chairman Dominic Barton saying, we don't have enough metal for the metals transition. Here's the article. This is Reuters via mining.com. Global mining investment too low to support energy transition, Rio Tinto chairman says. Low rates of investment in the global mining sector have put the global energy transition at risk, widening the supply gap in critical minerals like copper. Rio Tinto chairman Dominic Barton said on Monday, quote, the gap is humongous. And I'm actually very worried about whether we will be able to close it. End quote. Barton said via video link at the Ecosperity Conference in Singapore. He continues, the mining industry has reduced its investments significantly since the 2015-2016 period. We're hundreds of billions of dollars below what we need. End quote. There is a quick update for you. And again, earnings season starts next week. Coming up this episode, I'm very pleased to welcome back to the show Anthony Malowski, CEO of Nickel28, a producer of Cobalt and Nickel that also focuses on metal streaming and royalty agreements. And we're going to just discuss the latest goings on in Nickel, Cobalt, and the evolution of the narrative in battery metals. If you want to find us online, you can find us at northernminer.com. You can find us on Twitter at Northern Miner and on Instagram at The Northern Miner and on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, where we also host these podcasts and wherever podcasts are available, including SoundCloud, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. And with that, let's turn to the news. And turning to the website, BHP set to dethrone Cadelco as world's biggest copper producer. This is Bloomberg News via mining.com. The copper industry is about to get a new leader as BHP Group overtakes Cadelco in the global producer rankings, according to Bloomberg Intelligence estimates. As long as BHP's giant Escondida mine in Chile continues to step up production, the Australian company will nudge past Cadelco this year, disrupting the Chilean state-owned behemoth's reign as number one, said Bloomberg Intelligence analyst Grant Spohr. Still, Cadelco may recover the top spot in the years ahead as it battles to recover from delays and missteps at its projects. So, interesting headline there to start us off. And here we have another one. This is Reuters via mining.com. Copper output at Cadelco set to rise this year, according to Chesco, CESCO. Chile state-run copper miner Cadelco is poised to improve production this year. And of course, it's been struggling for years and begin to climb from its lowest dip in a quarter century, the head of Chilean Copper Study Center, CSCO, said ahead of a major industry conference that starts Monday. Cadelco is aiming to produce between 1.325 million tons and 1.39 million metric tons of copper this year, a target that at best would see it lightly overtake its 2023 output of 1.325 million metric tons. The goal appeared realistic, said Jorge Cantalops, head of the Center for Copper and Mining Studies in Chile, the world's top producer of the red metal. Quote, we think that the level of production this year will be better than the last one, end quote, he said in an interview on Friday. Then we got this other headline out of Bloomberg, Cadelco eyes partnerships to help boost ailing copper production. And this is on mining.com as well. Cadelco is exploring more partnerships with the private sector as Chile state copper behemoth looks to recover from a production slump and surging debt. Chairman Maximo Pacheco expects, quote, some conclusions, end quote, this year from teams negotiating on operational tie-ups between Andina Mine and Anglo-American, adjoining Los Broncos, he said, Monday in an interview. 
Quote, new projects and new partnerships are part of the essence of what we do in Cadelco. Paquet Show told Bloomberg from Santiago, which is hosting one of the world's largest copper industry events, Chesco Week and CRU's World Copper Conference. In another story on copper in Latin America, protesters agree to lift blockade near Las Bambas copper mine. This Reuters via mining.com. Protesters have agreed to lift a road blockade on a key Peruvian transport route near the Andean country's major Las Bambas copper mine. Sources with knowledge on the matter told Reuters on Thursday after reaching a deal with the miner. The mine, owned by China's MMG, had faced a fresh protest by local communities demanding greater benefits from the copper mine, a major producer in a country that ranks among the world's top suppliers of the red metal. Protest leader Robertson Pequecho and a source close to the company did not give details on the deal, but residents from Velil in Cusco's Chumbivilcas province has, according to the source, asked for an annual sum of 2 million soles, or half a million dollars. And another copper story here, global copper smelters less active after China's planned output cuts. This is Reuters via mining.com. More global copper smelters were not operating in March than in the first two months. Data from satellite surveillance of metal processing plants showed after Chinese smelters proposed to cut output and operations elsewhere undertook planned maintenance. Pretty wild satellite surveillance. Earth Eye which specializes in observational data, tracks smelters representing up to 90% of global production for its savant service and sells data to fund managers, traders, and miners. The company said that an average of 17.7% of global copper smelter capacity monitored was inactive in March compared with 11.5% during January and February combined. Average inactive capacity in China rose to 9% in March from 8.3%, In the first two months, it added in a statement on Thursday. China's top copper smelters proposed in late March to cut production by 5 to 10 percent, sources told Reuters, after the world's top producer of refined copper battled short supply of raw material and losses at some operations. Quote, we are now entering a period of several scheduled maintenance closures, end quote. So it seems the way this works is the less copper that's available, the more these smelters compete to refine the copper, and as a result, it would suggest that there is a lower supply of copper because fees are going down in order to refine it. That is the logic, I think, at work here. So they are now being taken offline so that the race to the bottom in pricing, the refinement of this copper, is halted. That is what I think is going on there. So continuing on, Congo seeks outside advice on imposing cobalt export curbs. This is Bloomberg News via mining.com. The Democratic Republic of Congo, the top cobalt producer, is sounding out advice from international industry organizations over measures to raise the battery metals price, including through potential export quotas. It's the latest attempt by the country, which supplies about 75% of the world's cobalt, to try to gain greater control of crucial minerals. Cobalt prices have plunged by two-thirds since mid-2022 as global supply races ahead of demand. In a ministerial meeting in February, President Felix Chisakedi bemoaned the slump caused by a glut amid excessive supplies from Congo. At that meeting, he then asked Prime Minister Sama Lukonde to look at the, quote, necessity of introducing export quotas, end quote, or any steps to achieve a, quote, fair price. So very interesting, and there was the lawsuit against the tech companies has been dismissed. There was a lawsuit put against the tech companies as being complicit in negative, you know, for lack of a better term, questionable mining practices in the DRC as buyers of this metal as being complicit. And that has been dismissed, by the way. Continuing on, Senegal says oil, gas, and mine contracts will be reworked if needed. So we have a new president in Senegal. Now mining is being added to the mix. There was a mention last week of oil and gas. Now mining as well. This is Reuters via mining.com. President Baziru Tiomai Fai, who defeated the ruling coalition candidate in a landslide election victory last month, announced the audit after his inauguration on April 2nd, assuring investors they were still welcome in the West African country. So miners added to the list. And continuing on, France wants to revive copper mining and speed up green projects. So whoever heard of a news article with copper mining and France in the same title? You know, I don't think I've ever seen that. France wants to revive copper mining and speed up green projects. This is Bloomberg News via mining.com. 
And it says in the article scrolling down, copper mining, which has been halted in France for more than two decades, should be considered again because of growing need for cables to connect solar and wind farms and to build new power interconnections with neighboring countries, the minister said. And here is Finance Minister Bruno Le Maire, who said on Friday, quote, let's use France's strengths. We've got wind, hydro, biomass, solar energy, as well as resources in our soil that we must quickly use. So pretty interesting story there. Continuing on, Valet Operations in Brazil, now 100% renewable energy powered. This is Cecilia Jamasmi on Mining.com. Valet announced Monday it had achieved its goals of running all of its Brazilian operations based on renewable energy sources two years earlier than the scheduled target of 2025. That is pretty impressive. The Rio de Janeiro-based top iron and nickel producer said that 100% of the electricity used in its local operations last year came from green sources such as hydroelectric, wind, and solar power plants. It does sound like hydroelectric is a game changer. Of course, Quebec also has a huge amount of hydroelectric power. Continuing on, Vanadium Resources enters offtake deal with Chinese firm. This is Reuters via mining.com. And so, so another interesting story involving China, Australia's Vanadium Resources said on Thursday, it entered into a memorandum of understanding with China's Panjin Hexiang New Materials Technology to supply 4,000 tons per annum for vanadium pentoxide for an initial five-year term. The deal represents a supply of about 37% of vanadium resources planned annual flake production capacity. So again, the Chinese, the first to make a deal there with vanadium resources, although apparently they are in talks with Japanese, Korean, and European end users. A couple more headlines here. Vitol CEO confirms energy trading giant is getting into metals. This is Bloomberg News via mining.com. Vitol Group confirmed that it's starting to rebuild a trading book for metals after a long stint out of the market with, quote, an exciting decade, end quote, ahead. Quote, it's a relatively small addition to our business, end quote, Chief Executive Officer Russell Hardy said to the Financial Times Commodities Summit on Tuesday. And finally, just a couple more headlines. Native American Group seeks to overturn U.S. court ruling on Rio's Arizona copper mine. This is Reuters via mining.com. A Native American group has asked all members of a U.S. appeals court on Monday to overturn an earlier ruling that granted land to Rio Tinto for a copper mine in Arizona, saying the land was sacred and culturally significant. So this Resolution Copper Project has, I believe, been in contention for decades, as far as I understand. And finally, Alaska sues EPA over pebble mine prohibitions, another mine that has been in contention for maybe 20 years here. This is Reuters via mining.com. Alaska sued the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency on Thursday, seeking to overturn an agency decision that it said effectively blocked development of one of the world's largest copper and gold deposits. The saga continues with Northern Dynasty. Those are your news stories. Now, let's take a look at metal prices. Turning to metal prices, let's take a quick look at the bond market for context. The U.S. 10-year bond is now yielding 4.63%. That is 0.23% higher than last week. So a big jump there. Starting to approach the 5% mark, amazingly. The U.K. 10-year gilt is at 4.25%. That is 0.2% higher than last week. And the Italy 10-year bond is yielding 3.85%. That is up 0.1%. From last week. So a bit more stability there. One wonders if it's lower bond rates in Italy because of the fear of recession in Europe. Hard to say, but all interesting that Italy borrows a 10-year bond almost a percent lower, like 0.8% lower than the United States. Turning to precious metals, gold is at $2,386.60 per ounce. That is $4 higher then last week, silver is at $28.48 per ounce. That is $0.34 cents higher than last week. Platinum is at $979.60 per ounce. That is $21 lower than last week. And palladium is at $1,036.50 per ounce. That is $28 lower 
than last week. So gold and silver higher, platinum and palladium lower. Turning to our industrial metals, copper is at $4.36 per pound. That is seven cents higher than last week. Iron ore is at $104.33 per metric ton. That is $2 higher than last week, but still quite low compared to where we were. Aluminum is at $1.16 per pound. That is $0.04 higher than last week. Lead is at $0.99 per pound. That is $0.04 higher than last week. Nickel is at $8.18 per pound. That is $0.18 higher than last week. Tin is at $14.68 per pound. That is $1.62 higher than last week. So tin really making a move. Cobalt is at $12.62 per pound. That is 33 cents lower than last week. Lithium is at $15.43 per kilogram. That is 29 cents higher than last week. Uranium is at $88.75 per pound. That is $1.75 higher than last week. And zinc is at $1.26 per pound. That is 5 cents higher than last week. Zooming out, it still looks like metals, generally speaking, are on the upswing. Interestingly, when you look at the U.S. dollar chart, the dollar is doing fairly well. So we're seeing commodities perform well on a strong dollar. In other words, they're getting extra expensive, with the standouts being really gold and silver edging higher and tin and zinc looking quite healthy, as well as copper. It seems to be across the board, again, on a strong dollar. And those are your metal prices. Coming up, I'm very pleased to welcome Anthony Malowski, CEO of Nickel 28, to discuss the nickel and cobalt markets, as well as the electric vehicle battery narrative, and what is happening in the market from Anthony's perspective. I hope you enjoy the interview, and I will see you on the other side. Joining us today, I'm very pleased to welcome back to the show after a bit of a hiatus here, Anthony Malowski, CEO of Nickel 28. Anthony, welcome back. Thanks a lot for having me. I always enjoy chatting. As do I. I think the last time we talked, it was maybe around the time of the Inflation Reduction Act when it was coming <laughs> into form. I remember us talking about that. All to say, there you are uh, working on nickel. So I guess what is new? I mean, there's so much to talk about. How are things going at Nickel 28? Well, great. I mean, just from the perspective of the company, you know, you know, we're a large nickel producer located in Papua New Guinea, and you know, we're a low-cost producer, and so our material primarily goes into the battery industry in in China. So, you know, we haven't actually experienced problems. I would say the nickel industry more broadly has had a really rough go since the last time we spoke. What you've seen, you know, is is really the rise of Indonesian production now probably at 70% of global supply, a bunch of shutdowns across in particular Australia, but also South America and Canada. And so you've seen that industry really shift since the last time we speak, just because of new supply coming in from Indonesia, really. So, I mean, we're hearing about all of these nickel mines that need to be shut down because they're unprofitable. Are you able to be profitable? Like, how is it working for you? Because it sounds like it's not going too badly, whereas well, yeah, I mean, no, no, we're seeing... I mean, I think right? the key is we're just a low cost producer. You know, we're one of the lowest cost producers. And so, you know, we sit, you know, on the ocean, you know, tidewater, and just the operation itself is probably one of the lowest, you know, it's definitely the lowest quartile producer. So we haven't experienced problems. But what has happened is the technology actually that's being used in Indonesia, in large part, was actually developed by some of the operators at the mine, MCC's, you know, consulting agencies. And, you know, what's happened is that shifted the cost curve. And so Indonesia, by shifting the cost curve down, has made these higher cost production mines in Australia and Canada unprofitable. And it's also, of course, increased the supply by, you know, a pretty significant amount. And, you know, while in the long run, that's probably really good in the sense that um, we need this supply for the EV transition. You know, in the short run, it's very hard, not only for the producers to shut down, but it's also challenging, I think, for some of the aspirational companies who want to go out and build mines in, in Canada and South America. It's going to make it challenging because I think, you know, in order for the securing of funding, which is in a lot of cases, a multi-billion dollar endeavor, 
the investors and the backers behind that are going to need to see a, a longer, higher nickel price. One of the interesting things that's kind of a result of that is you have a further consolidation of that entire supply chain into China. But not everyone realizes most nickel production is like kind of done on a 10 to 1 ratio, 10 units of nickel for every one unit of cobalt. So that also means that this is outside of the Congo, and the Congo, cobalt, and copper are connected. And so what that also means is the ex-Congolese cobalt supply is further consolidated into China when you consolidate in the nickel production. So, you know, the upshot of this is heavy consolidation inside of Indonesia, over 70% now, and a supply chain that's going to be hard to diversify outside of that Chinese control because people just aren't going to build a $2 billion mine or $3 billion mine in Canada right now at the current nickel price. Interesting. So you just happen to benefit, really, because you're in PNG and you have a low-cost mine. I think it's a JV that yeah. you're involved with. And I suppose the shipping costs, like when you have your ore and it's you know in some sort of raw form, I guess, this gets shipped over to Indonesia, I guess is what you're telling me. No, no, our, our material goes to China. You know, we, oh, it goes we directly to China. China. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, there's no connection with us in Indonesia. It's simply that you know, there is a lot of processing and, and that sort of thing happening and mining, but but the Indonesian thing is a completely separate piece. Gotcha. Okay. And do you know what the nickel is being used for? I remember the last time we spoke, and maybe you could review this very quickly, like there's different kinds of nickel. I mean, yeah. the general investor or person on the street, for them, nickel is nickel. But can you quickly just remind us about the different yeah, no, kinds it, of nickel it, it, and what your nickel is being used for? So I think I'll, I'll, I'll help visualize it. There's, you know, ferro nickel and there's different, there's these different names, but I think an easy way to think about it is like, what is the form of the nickel, right? And, you know, imagine if you have this big bar of nickel or, or this is true, by the way, for cobalt as well, right? And you want to use that for chemicals. So you have to put it somewhere and then put acid on it and then effectively melt it. I'm kind of, you know, Exactly. Like a, just to illustrate the point, but you're melting it down, right? So that's one kind of form. You know, Russian ingots would be a, a version of that for like cobalt, just to help you illustrate it. But one of the advantages to nickel, like from our operation, is when it shows up, it's effectively in these bags. We ship it. It's effectively these good crushed rock in a bag, right? If you can imagine these huge sacks. And there's all this crushed rock in it. And then when it is then converted or melted down, it's not actually melted into such, but, you know, the chemicals are applied. It's much easier to take that and transfer that into the chemicals industry. And so one of the things to think about, not just for nickel, but for cobalt and, and a lot of different metals is, you know, how is it ultimately going to be used? Because the form that it starts off in, so when you mine and then process it and it goes to the refinery or whatever happens, that form that it's being transported into the end user dictates the cost to transfer that material into whatever you're building. And so when it shows up, it matters what it shows up as because that dictates how much it costs to get this raw material into the chemicals for a battery, into steel, into whatever it is. And so effectively, it's always fungible. If you have nickel or you have cobalt, effectively, you could ultimately get it to whatever form you need to get it to. It's just that there's a cost and an energy transfer to do that. And so, you know, certain types of mines with certain types of processing will have an advantage for one end use over another just because the starting point of that material is less expensive to transfer or convert it into whatever the thing is that you're going to use it for. That makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. So to rephrase, the form that it comes in to a large degree dictates how it's going to be processed and what you're going to do with it because some if you get it one way, it's going to be more cost effective to turn it into, you know, a version exactly. C. So when you're yeah. an end buyer, yeah, so if you're an end buyer and there's some global shortage of cobalt, just I mean, there's not, by the way, but if, if there was in this example, you could ultimately buy the cobalt or the nickel or fill in the blank in any form available in the market, right? And in fact, you know, the LME is kind of interesting because there's different types and forms listed, right? And you buy a warrant and unless you know ahead of time what you're going to take delivery of, then you get whatever shows up, right? And this is in a scarce market. But in, in normal times, and most of the time it is normal, as the consumer of the nickel or whatever, you're going to go out and pick a supplier that's going to send it to you in the most efficient form for you to use 
for whatever widget you're making, you're going to buy that form. And, you know, and this is kind of, get, it gets lost on people like graphite, for instance, hyper specific, you know, hyper specific, and even lithium to a certain extent, you know, there are different types of lithium, different grades of lithium. And, you know, w- once again, what you're going to use it for really matters on what shows up. And so, you know, just in general, when people are looking at mining projects. They think, oh, this is nickel, it's used for batteries, or, oh, this is lithium, it's used for batteries, or, or, you know, oh, this is cobalt. It's not true. Like cobalt, for instance, the super alloy industry prefers metal. Like, you know, they prefer a very specific type of metal, like they like the Russian ingots or, you know, whatever they used to. So just in general, when you're looking at a mining project and thinking about it, the form the consumer wants actually really matters. And that people don't always think about that or talk about that. It's so true. It is so true. And it often gets lost in uh, people just using, you know, the word, quote unquote, nickel. But like, let's flip this around, like gold, it's just a bar. Fine. Because you melt it. It's the, the melting point of gold. It's super easy. It's malleable and it doesn't matter. Right. So once again, if you like, if we had this list and you went through the list and we talked about each of the different materials, you know, it would probably be different for each of the materials, depending on, of course, what they're used for. And I would say the more industrial the material, like the more niche, the more specific, there's probably a likelihood that in fact, and graphite is, is an example of this, but let's see to a certain extent is also an example of this. So the more niche, the more industrial, the more specific the spec needs to be to an actual consumer of it. And so like graphite, you know, you might only be shipping to a very few producers right? It's simply because what they need is so specific. Now, copper, on the other hand, like it doesn't matter, right? I mean, it matters, but not in that same way. And so sometimes when people are evaluating projects, they say, oh, well, I've got graphite and the global graphite price is this and multiply this number. by, And, and that's totally false because what needs to happen is you have to spend years in some cases testing your material, making sure it's right for these two end users. And then you're hostage to those, in, in this example, you're hostage to those end users. Now, Nickel, it's not that way, and lithium, it's not that way. They're much bigger markets. But as you increasingly look at a niche market, that becomes even more true and more important. As you move away from a niche market to some like gold market or copper or one of these, you know, sort of really ubiquitous metals, that starts to change again, right? And so just on a a final point on this then, do you know what the nickel 28's nickel is being used for? Yeah, batteries. I mean, primarily it's going into the chemical industry in China for sure. So yeah, so that's uh, and it's it's the right use. It's this cr- as I described it, this crushed rock that goes through fire. And I mean, it's it's kind of an ideal material for that use. Okay, excellent. Now you were telling me uh, before the show that the narrative is changing somewhat from electric vehicles to more, I guess you know, stuff like powering AI. Could you speak to that a little bit? Like, how is the narrative changing? I think some people might be surprised to hear that. Well, you know, I, I think if you look at the sources of capital inside of the mining industry, you have the rise of mining private equity, which was driven by low interest rates, right? Because, you know, you've got Orion with $8 billion now, and, and the promise was, look, we'll show you yield in a world without yield. And, you know, a bunch of mining private equity firms raised money around that after the global financial crisis. And almost no one raised money for hedge funds or for, you know, more liquid money focused on the space. And so, the driver of capital allocation into the space in the equities has been hedge funds like Millennium. And those pools of capital are largely driven by thematics. And so, you know, over the last five years, electric vehicles has been this thematic because you've seen the rise of stocks like Tesla and, and a bunch of others. And so that's kind of trickled down into the mining space and the non-special investor and specialist investors that you've seen are actually you know, at the millenniums of the world. And now I think what you're seeing is AI, that thematic just generally with, you know, tensions in Taiwan and and semiconductors and all these sorts of things. You've seen the rise of a bunch of equities in NVIDIA, right? And that is now flowing into the mining space and it's coming in in a few different ways. I think Uranium benefits from that narrative that need to generate huge, huge amounts of power for these data centers. Uranium also benefits from environmentalists starting to realize that it's kind of the only clean source of energy. And then, you know, you've seen copper benefit as well for transmission and just the U.S. power grid is old and it needs to be done. In fact, power grids around the world, by and large, need need a lot of help. So that narrative has the excitement from 
non-specialist capital is kind of refocusing around these narratives. Now, that's not to say that demand for nickel or demand for lithium has collapsed. It's simply to say that the investor excitement and interest has shifted because there's a new shiny thing, right? And that new shiny thing is CPUs for processing and the data centers and AI and the chips and the, it, how much power it takes for the ships. And it's very intensive for the algorithms to be learning. And so, so there's kind of two things going on there. Yeah. And just quickly on the electric vehicle situation, I mean, I'm sure you've been seeing in the headlines, you know, Europe is getting concerned. They want to put tariffs on, you know, BYD cars coming into Europe. You know, there's concern in the U.S. about this factory that they want to build in Mexico. Do you have any thoughts on the whole EV situation where it looks like BYD or Chinese automobile manufacturers can just undercut everybody? Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I've been saying this for a long time. I've always thought that China's investment into the supply chain in natural resources reflected a broader strategy, which was, you know, they, they don't want to sell you a a battery. They want to sell you a car. And I think that's always been the case. And so they've built up that capacity. And I actually think where this goes in the long run or the midterm, maybe not in the long run, is I think that for all the reasons that you've just stated, there's going to be this backlash and pushback from countries around putting these cars into their countries. So I think what happens is the BYDs of the world or whoever it is actually start buying Western brands. So, you know, you, yeah, I, I think you'll see Porsche is owned by BYD. I mean, I'm making that up. That's not the right example, but I, I think that that they're, they're going to find this moment of pushback now with their cars, but they still control the supply chain. And so I predict that, that ultimately they'll buy certain cars as a way into these countries. And so you'll be buying a Chinese Range Rover or whatever it is, right? And do you think that anybody outside of China can compete with them now that they do, you know, as you say, almost own this vertical? And I remember you telling me that actually two or three years ago when we last talked, exactly what you just said. They want to sell us the car, not just the battery. And you're absolutely right on that. I, I, do you see any hope of anyone outside of China competing right now? Because the prices that I'm seeing are shocking. Yeah, I, I've been thinking about this, actually. Of course, it's not all lost. I mean, the U.S. or Canada could decide that they wanted to fund nickel production and use tax dollars to do that. I have no reason to believe that that's actually going to happen. Although I note that at BMO this year, the annual kind of one of the top mining conference annually, there were a number of U.S. government agencies there like looking to invest in, and put money to work in the space inside of the U.S., but that's kind of a misnomer because of the deposits are in Africa, it doesn't matter. But what I see as a risk now is as China continues to pull away, while well, the US sits around and talks about it, as they continue to pull away, maybe governments will slow down their backing of electric vehicles because they'll start to worry, or, or maybe they'll back a different technology, which sounds crazy, but maybe they'll say, well, we're gonna back hydrogen. Which, by the way, wouldn't be a bad technology for like semis, like having hydrogen stations spaced across America so that you ship from New York to San Francisco actually has always made the most sense. But I am actually starting to worry that because of inaction in the U.S. and Canada, and as China slowly pulls further ahead, you know, maybe politicians will sort of throw up their hands and start to subsidize a different technology. Or do I mean, and I don't. This hasn't happened, so I'm just speculating. But like that's kind of where we're at in the whole dynamic at the moment, I think. It is quite astonishing to watch. And it's like Australia has opened up to BYD. And you just think of Africa, you think of South America. And these are like the growth markets, one assumes, right? And they're going to probably welcome it. Hey, we all have cheap cars now, you know, like uh, so... It just seems like, you know, Europe and North America can do whatever they want. I mean, there still are, you know, a whole bunch of other people that want a car out there that maybe have never even owned one before. Yeah. No, it's true. So, you know, you know, an example completely different. But if you go to Africa, you know, there aren't a bunch of power lines everywhere for um, phones, right? Like they skipped a whole generation of technology and went straight to cell phones, right? So maybe, maybe some of these countries will skip you know, largely a whole generation of automobile technology in China and elsewhere and just go straight to electric vehicles. So, and by the way, maybe what ultimately has to happen is that the U.S. and Europe have to just accept that 
China's going to control the automobile industry, which is, you know, by the way, sitting in Detroit, I mean, America had that for a long time, right? So I don't really see another way unless a different technology is backed or if the U.S. just sort of completely steps away from it, which would be pretty sad. Now, I will say the other side of this is if everybody in America drove an EV right now, I don't know that you would have a power grid to support that. And so, you know, maybe, you know, maybe part of it is just giving some time to it's going to slow down the growth rate potentially like in the u.s market but that also gives time for the power grid to catch up right right exactly which probably needs to happen as you say and do you have any thoughts as well on the sanctions that were just put in just this weekend i'm sure you saw the headline the uh Russia, Russia you know on aluminum and copper i look exactly lme like, and and cme yeah, I mean, for nickel for nickel if the metal was already listed on the lme it could stay and, you know, that's largely ferro-nickel that goes into China already because this war now with Ukraine has been going on. And so it had an immediate impact of, you know, nickel was up 8 or 9% or something, and then it faded back down. And so, you know, a lot of Western traders have already or had already moved away from trading Russian material just as a compliance issue. And so it's had very little effect. I, I think that had already really happened by and large, meaning... The material was already going into China. The Russian material was already on the LME if it was warranted. And traders in the West had largely not opt trade that material. So I, I don't think it, you know, it had kind of the impact that it might have had if it had happened at the beginning of the war. My concern when I see, say, stuff like the sanctions is that it sounds like to me just from the articles I'm reading that maybe China gets a bit of a deal from Russia and that maybe there's a bit of an active strategy now to basically provide cheap energy and cheap metals to say China and the rest of the global South potentially or whoever their trading partners are. And that ultimately the costs as we're seeing with China now in the automobile industry in very stark, clear terms, that ultimately the, that is like the structural way that they will you know, disrupt you know, the Western economic hegemony, so to speak, for lack of better, you know, words here. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? You know, I don't think it's as true for nickel. I mean, for nickel, um, I would say it's not true. Now, you know, if you start talking about energy and coal and some of these, you know, and, and it's, of course, on the case by case, because there's not general sanctions across everything. I think that that being the factor that, that disrupts the industrial complex in the West, is I think is a bit rich because commodities traders being who they are, even though they're all in trouble right now, if that arbitrage became too big, I just feel like that material would start to leak its way out into the West. So I'm not sure that I think it's an overstatement to like claim that, yeah, I, China is getting discounts. I think that's true. That's for sure true. But that that's undermining the industrial complex in the West, I think, is a bit much. I'd be more concerned if I was the U.S. government like about uranium and are you going to be able to get your uranium supplies that's shut off or they shut you off from Kazakhstan? You know, your shooting all these missiles around the world like what are you able to get the rare earths you need not processed in america i mean i would be more concerned about those types of issues than i would be around russia selling a little bit of a discount material into china fair enough okay here's another angle on this then like i think you probably have seen andrew forrest and and this whole idea of there being a green nickel price Right, yeah. which seems to be, and of course you're involved in nickel, so maybe there's you no have, green nickel price. There's a nickel price, right? But there is a push right now, which seems to me to be a direct response to what's going on with Indonesia's oversupply. I think Andrew Forrest has directly said to manufacturers, "You better be careful where you're getting your nickel from if you're getting it out of Indonesia, because it's probably not green." And there's a real strong push right now to get the LME to adopt a green nickel price, even though they have resisted that. Do you have any thoughts on this whole issue? Yeah, I, I don't see it happening anytime soon because it, you know, it's a great idea, but you know, no one wants to adopt it. So unless the US government mandated the sale of EVs to have green, and then how do you define green nickel? You know, what does that mean? And then if you're going to do it for nickel, are you going to do it for cobalt? Are you going to do it for copper? It seems to me that you know, consumers are completely disintermediated from the supply chain, right? Like what, where, do, where do hamburgers come from? McDonald's. Well, no, actually they start off as a cow, right? You know, you know, someone's going to come up to protest your mind in their SUV that's got tin and copper and powered by gasoline. So I think that they're completely 
this intermediated. And so when they see a Tesla show up at their house, they're not thinking about shovels in the Congo and digging up cobalt. They're just not. Uh, they're not thinking about tin out of Malaysia or, you know, so we've been talking about this now for five or six years, and I really haven't seen that tax emerge. And r- by the way, look at look at carbon credits. Really interesting idea. I'm a big, really big supporter of it. And it's just totally been crushed because it's a form of a tax. And now that things changed with higher interest rates, they're not interested in it. You know, green nickel in a way is a tax. If you think about it, right, you're going to pay a premium for this thing. And it doesn't seem that the market is really going to support that anytime soon. You'd almost have to have that come at a government level, be mandated. And, you know, it would have to apply to a bunch of different metals. And by the way, I don't disagree with Andrew around what's happening in Indonesia. It's pretty damaging to the environment, but it just seems like there's not a push from consumers to make that happen. Right. And if, you know, let's say Western automakers are at a disadvantage now, I mean, what happens when all of a sudden they have to pay an extra tax on their inputs, right? I mean, it just seems like now is not the time to a certain degree. It, it, do you agree with that? They're still getting Indonesian nickel. It's not like it's not like we're saying, oh, no, there's a tax break because you're getting your nickel from Canada. Like, no, that's not that's not real. That's not happening. So I kind of agree with you. So I, I look, I think, you know, there could be industries or specific situations, but it, it seems like right now that's still a long ways away. Okay, excellent. So as we wrap up, is there anything that you're seeing on your radar that we haven't discussed just big picture on anything? You know, I would say for the first time in like forever, gold is really interesting. I mean, you have gold approaching and crossing all time highs. And, you know, the driver of that is really, and it's kind of back to the topic we've been talking about, the driver of that is central bank buying and also like Chinese retail. So it's ex-U.S. allies buying gold. You know, it's the Chinese government, the Russians, a bunch of other countries buying gold. And so it's a, a source of demand, which traditionally wasn't there. And I think it's this, you know, we're in this post-World War II era now. A lot of those people who served have passed on and are kind of in this new reshaping reforming of alliances world. And I think gold is telling you that. And, you know, that's so that's really interesting and, and something which has not been true now for a long time. Anthony Malowski, CEO of Nickel 28. Thank you for joining us and sharing your insights on this week's Northern Miner podcast. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Thank you once again to Anthony Malowski, CEO of Nickel 28, for joining us today. And thank you, dear listener, for joining us on this extraordinary journey through what is happening in mining, which seems to be increasingly at the heart of the global conversation on political economy here. So I hope you enjoyed the show. And if you did enjoy it, feel free to leave us a review in the Apple Podcast directory, share it with your friends. And until next week, take care.